Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about what is marketing. And for me, when I think what marketing is, is marketing solves problems. I mean, think about it. You're not sure what to sell to your customers. Marketing helps you figure that out. What are our customers thinking? Marketing solves that. Hey, if you're a venue, what band do we bring to our concert hall? Oh, marketing solves that. Uh, what do I charge the tickets for that band? Marketing solves that. How do I talk to people? Marketing solves that. I mean, that's what marketing is. It solves problems. The thing is, when you solve problems, you're finding value, you're creating value. And there's a lot of different parts of marketing, but overall, boiling it down to just what the core of marketing is, it really is about solving problems, okay? And if we look at the technical definition of marketing from the American Marketing Association, and yes, I'm gonna read this because I don't memorize my lines, but I'm gonna go through what this really is. Look, the AMA says marketing is the activity, set of institutions and processes for creating capturing, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. So what are they saying? Well, not only is marketing about solving problems, but marketing creates value. It's all about value, figuring out what people value, what's important to them, what's their needs and their wants, but also what can we do to deliver things that they might not know about. It is all kinds of things that marketing does. And we look at it, it really is, you know, a combination of all the processes that buyers and sellers go through in order to exchange things of value. I mean, think about it. I value a Culver's double butter burger cheese and Culver's values my money, right? And so we've got an exchange in there. So you think about these things. And that's why if we look at really the core aspects of marketing that go into this kind of problem solving, you know, value creation kind of stuff, really what you go down to and really one of the core things of marketing is really knowing that we have to satisfy customers' wants and needs. And we'll talk about the differences between the two, but this is one of those things you really have to think Think about is what is it that our customers really need what do they want out of our their products and services and knowing that goes a long way all right and also you have to realize that marketing really is an exchange of goods and services for money i mean and the thing is the money side of an exchange it could be actual money but also it could be buying into a belief because you'll see marketing isn't just about having a glass of soda and buying the glass and the drink inside and the tastiness no it's also buying into belief that ah yes Coke is this far superior soda, right? I mean, how much is that worth? And so that's one thing you're kind of thinking about. Also, marketing entails the four Ps, the marketing mix. Product creates value. Price, that captures the value. Uh, place, that delivers the value. And promotion, that communicates the value. All these things go into your marketing, all right? And, and what you have to realize is marketing can be done by individuals. Like, I'm trying to sell you to be a marketing major. Why don't you sign up to become a marketing major? Yes, it'll be a great job. You can get to see people, deal with people, be out in the world, create new things, solve problems out there. But also, when you look at marketing, it's also organizations do that. I mean, remember back in the day when you had the Got Milk campaign from like the Dairy Association of America? I think that's who did it. And they drink the milk and it was all about the industry trying to market to you. So you have that. And the thing is, marketing can really happen anywhere. I mean, how many of you were sitting in line at a store and you saw the little ad at the checkout? You're like, huh, maybe I will get that Kit Kat chunky. Mm -hmm. you, you have to realize this, wherever you are, marketing happens it's on your phone it's on the billboards it's on the street it's word of mouth there's so many different ways that we can communicate with our clients and and we're marketing all the time and i know some people feel that it's over the top but we have to realize this there are a lot of opportunities out there to be marketing to people and we have to be ready for it that's why when you look on websites they always have that little shopping cart in the corner because you never know when you want to buy hey why don't you pick up a walters world shirt at waltersworld.store i mean these things happen and you never know when they're going to click you know what I want to buy that all right and the thing is overall marketing really does help create value okay because you might not think about you know well, it's a drink this is a, just just a drink right but the thing is it's hot I'm here in Georgia on Tybee Island about going to the beach it's starting to get a little hot who I'm talking a lot and this ice cold coca-cola will help quench my thirst and let me talk some more and film some more videos wow I never thought of it that way this is creating value for me Mmm, 
soothing, right? And so we kind of think about these things. And marketing is more than just selling and promoting. It's also, you know, understanding people and things like that. And, and we have to realize this marketing really impacts a lot of people, not just the people we sell to, but think about all the stakeholders that are out there in our business, okay? The people that work for us our suppliers, the retailers that sell our products, the customers that are out there, but also our community. I know, I know I'm know, i drinking a Coke, right? I, I love my Coca-Cola, but I always give a shout out to Refreshment Services Pepsi in my hometown because their stakeholders are their community. And so they'll go put up, you know, signs and they'll help pay for, you know, sports complexes and stuff like that and, and, and put things out there to help out the community because they realize, look, we don't just direct our marketing to the end customer. We might direct it to a whole community so then everybody's feeling good about our product. So when they go to the store, they feel, hey, I should buy this. Now, I'm buying Coke because I'm in Georgia where Coke is from and Pepsi that I know is in my hometown of Quincy. So there are some differences there. And the thing is, is when you see different types of marketing, you might see in terms of stakeholders, you might see employment marketing. I mean, I know when I'm at work, I get emails every so often like, hey, you want to come see the Illinois football game? We got tickets for faculty. And so they're marketing the football to internal people, right? Also, have you ever been marketed to by when you got recruited for a job? Like, hey, come to our barbecue to find out. Hey, we have a pre-night drinks on Rust Street. Why don't you come talk to us before we interview you? They have those things, so there's employment marketing. But also you see what's called in industry marketing. So you see where the industry promotes things, that's that whole Got Milk campaign or Avocados de Mexico, the, the Mexican avocado industry promoting those things, you have that. But also we have to think about, wait, we have to you know promote and we have to market and sell to retailers as well. Like how do we get them to, like how do I get Walmart to carry my Walters World t-shirt? I have to think about that. I've got to market to them to understand why this would be a good shirt for them to carry. And so we kind of think about that. So there's a lot of things that marketing does. And, and I hope you'll stick with me to watch some more of our videos on marketing because we've got all kinds of videos covering all kinds of topics to help people out learn more about marketing. So whether you're a business student sitting in class or sitting online learning, or you're somebody at home trying to start your own business, or maybe you just want to brush up for a new job, I hope these videos can help you out know more about marketing. And I wish you all the best. And I'll see you on the next video. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're here on Tybee Island in Georgia and today we're going to talk about are some misconceptions that people have about marketing and one of the ones that I actually get a lot in my class is people think that advertising and sales is the same thing as marketing. Well, advertising and sales are a part of marketing, but marketing is so much more than trying to get people to buy stuff. Marketing is from the concept idea to when we hand it off to our customer and give them service afterwards. All that supply chain, those four Ps, we develop the product and these kind of things to figure out what people want. The prices, we determine what people value and how much we should charge for stuff. The place, where we're gonna sell it, how we're gonna sell it, what's the website gonna be like, that goes in there. The promotion side of it, yes, that's where your advertising comes in. That's where your sales come in. But marketing is much more than advertising and sales. So don't think it's just selling stuff. No, it's from creating to doing strategy. Oh, so much more. And another thing I get from a lot of people is they say, oh, marketing, it's just qualitative. It's just touchy feely things. Look, if anyone is following marketing these days, they know that quantitative hard numbers are what tells marketers what to do. If you want to know what videos to post on YouTube, if you want to know what products to sell in your store, you better believe that everyone is looking at the numbers. Hey, what is being sold what day? When are things getting watched? We look at the numbers and the quantitative side of it, the data analysis side of marketing is the true heart of marketing now to figure out what really does work. Because you can say, oh, I feel people would go to the beach in the morning because that's when it's not busy. So it should be busy. Hmm, no one's here, so I guess I shouldn't be out here selling stuff this time. I would look at the numbers to show that, look, nobody's at the beach in the morning, so there's no point to take my beach vendor thing out there to try to sell ice cream or drinks or anything like that. Now, the next misconception I hear people talk about with marketing, especially from some of my students, they like to cross their arms and say, oh, marketing is just common sense. Nobody needs to study that. Obviously, people will buy what I think is best for them. Uh, no, people don't buy what you think is the best for them. I mean, think about it. How many of you buy the cheapest phone or buy the cheapest clothes or buy the cheapest vacation? You don't because you didn't have to study it. Oh, the lowest price always wins, but the lowest price doesn't always win. Do you want to take the lowest price flight all the time? Do you want to be on the lowest cost safety car out there? No, there's value out there. And that's what marketing does. It helps us communicate that value, helps us 
learn what people do value that they're willing to pay more money for. Because think about it, without marketing, I mean, marketing for the big accounting firms, that's how they get people to spend thousands of dollars on their tax returns versus, you know, 50 bucks at Walmart, you know, during tax season. There's a lot that goes into it. And so we have to think about that. And another misconception I see people have is they think, oh, if I give people stellar service, it will always help us do better. Well, you see restaurants and you see stores that have given really great customer service and even they've gone out of business. Why? Well, what you have to realize is stellar customer service is worth it if people are willing to pay for it. If people aren't willing to pay for that excellent service, then maybe you don't need to give it to them. Yeah, you can feel good about doing it, but people might not value it. Because as much as I love my Delta people when I fly, they're so friendly, they're so kind, they're so nice. But if it's a flight from Chicago to Paris, and one is $1,000 and one's $250, yeah, I value the loveliness of Delta, but man, that 250 that 250 flight, ah, ooh, gee, that's tough for me to pass that up. I enjoy the stellar service, but sometimes the price will trump that. So you have to think about that. Now, another one that's kind of counterintuitive when we think about marketing is, if we give people more than what they expect, more than they need, they'll be super happy with what they have and they'll come back and shop with us again. Well, how many of you have gone to a store and just been so overwhelmed by the options, you don't know what to do? It's like I go to our local liquor store and I'm like, I, it's called, you know, there's Benny's and there's Fryer Tuck. I go to both of them, I walk in, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a big box store of alcohol. I don't know what to do. They've got thousands of beers there. And I'm like, ah, what do I do? I buy the beer I already know, right? Because it's just too overwhelming. And it goes into the same thing with that stellar service. Look, all the extras, will be worthwhile to people if the extras are worthwhile to them. If it's not, it actually can turn people off. There's a reason why people like Aldi. Look, it's simple, it's to the point. It's not like Target where you randomly find stuff you wanna buy. Aldi is I go in, I shop. I mean, part of it, you'll save money at Aldi. Part of it is because their prices are low, but also part of it is because they don't have all the extras. You're not getting your orange vanilla Coke that you heard about on TV. They don't have that there. But at Target, they've got an end cap. Why don't you grab one on your way out? And the last thing I want to say, last misconception I want to bring up, and this is one I've actually had students come to my office about, and that is marketing is the devil. It makes people buy stuff they don't need. Look, I have a little thing about that. Nobody forces anybody to buy anything. It's not like Ronald is there with a gun saying, you will buy McDonald's for your kid. No, people make their own choices. Marketers can only get people to do so much. We can only influence them so much. Because what it really comes down to are the needs, the wants, and the desires of those customers. That's what's gonna get them to do it. It's not Ronald saying, buy our food. It's parents saying, look, I'm tired. I don't wanna to cook tonight. My kid actually eats the food. He gets a toy, she gets a toy. We're all happy, let's go home. I mean, think about it. There's a lot more to it than that, all right? The thing is, there's a lot more marketing misconceptions out there. Why don't you put some of your marketing misconceptions you've heard, or you know about, or maybe you have, down in the comments section below so we can have a discussion about some of these marketing misconceptions that are out there, all right? So I wish you all the best. I apologize for the wind. It's really started to kick up this morning. So uh, I will see you later and I'll say bye from here on Tybee Island in Georgia. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we're here in Utrecht in the Netherlands and today we're going to talk about are the differences between needs, wants and demands when it comes to dealing with our clients because there are very different things and if you know in marketing one of our jobs is to figure out what the wants and needs are of our customers to develop products that really meet those needs and really fulfill those wants and desires and stuff like that so that people demand it and buy it and so I think it's important we go through each of these so you understand when people talk about needs versus wants versus demands you have an idea of the differences that are out there okay now when you look at a need okay a need is really when there's a lack of something there it's a state of deprivation so when you're hungry it's the lack of food that makes your tummy growl and makes you hangry and stuff like that when you're tired it's the lack of sleep or lack of rest that's out there when you're thirsty it's a lack of a drink or a beverage it's these kind of things like the really kind of core of what things are I need sleep I need food I need shelter these kind of things things people have to have so when you think of a phone the need that a phone fulfills is the need to communicate 
whether it is via email or text messages or phone calls, you have all those things you have to think about. And that leads into what the wants are. And wants are basically how we interpret our needs. And these needs have been influenced. Like the wants are the needs that have been influenced by, whether it's the, the influencers you see on Instagram that takes these really cool pictures, like, oh, I've got to go to Utrecht with the canals and fun stuff going on there. Or you see the blue city in Morocco, go, oh my goodness, it's so cool. I want to have my vacation there. That's just, I want to have my vacation there. I need to relax, but I want to be here in Utrecht where it's this beautiful city with all kinds of great things to see that I saw on Instagram and stuff like that. And so we as marketers are trying to figure out how can we change those needs that people have until once they want to buy our product and things like that. And so if you think about it, like your need of I am hungry, the one for hungry is I want to eat at this place. So I want to have a, a Culver's cheeseburger or a McDonald's Big Mac or something like that. And so advertising can influence that. Influences can influence that. Just our own personality. Like I don't like this kind of food, so I won't get that. I want something else. You have all these things out there. That's why travel is and travel sites have spent so much money on marketing influencers and Instagram influencers and videos and stuff like that because they know, hey, people need to take a vacation. They need to get away. But if we show them really cool pictures, they might want to go to this specific place, okay? That's why you see so many pictures that are like, obviously like Instagram perfect pictures. I'm like, oh, I go to Barcelona, I've got to get that picture. I go to Amsterdam, I have to get this picture. I go to Morocco, I have to get these pictures because they know that's what people want. I want that Instagram. I need a vacation, but I want to have that Instagram picture that's that's going to make my show people that I had a good vacation. So you have that. And then you look at demands and basically what demands are, these are ones where people have the ability to buy. So you look at it this way, the need for a vacation, you're like I'm, I need to rest, I need to recharge, I need that vacation. I want to go someplace I really like and I have the money to go to places like Utrecht. So I demand to go there. So I have the money to spend it on things. And so we as marketers have to realize what these needs and wants are, but also we got to change people's wants into demands. Like, look, I'm willing to spend the money for that. So you'll advertise and you'll market in a way that makes people really want to want to have something, right? And so you do that. So we're trying to change those needs into a perceived want, into a perceived like, we got the money, let's spend it. So we as marketers really need to know all three of these things so we can kind of know what's important what are the core aspects that need to be fulfilled because if you come to Utrecht and you don't have a good time and you don't get to relax it's not really gonna be a good vacation right so we got to make sure there's stuff to do it's not just a good Instagram picture there's really great restaurants and bars and hotels and shopping and stuff like that because all that goes into there to fulfill that need of a relaxing restful time but also fills the want of having a cool good time with really cool pictures and spots to go on and things like that and so people end up demanding it and spending their money for it okay so I hope that kind of helps you understand the differences between needs, wants, and demands, so you as a mark can figure these things out for yourself because every client will be different, so you want to really kind of figure out is what, what are the things we have to get done and what do we need to do in order to get them to either be interested in our product, buy our product, or more importantly, demand our product. So if you want to learn more, check us out on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Professor Walters. And if you want to find out about Utrecht and other places in the Netherlands, you can also check out our travel channel at youtube.com slash Walters World to have some fun in the Netherlands. Anyway, I wish you all the best and bye from Utrecht. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about one of the most important topics in marketing, and that is your value proposition. What makes your product or your service so dang special? Because you need to make sure you can articulate that in order to let your potential clients know why you're so special, why they should buy from you, why you're the perfect fit for them. And so this video is gonna go over how you develop your value propositions, okay? And yes, that is a plural because it's not just one, you're gonna see that you might have multiple value propositions you can offer to your potential clients. And the thing is your value proposition really puts into words the opportunities that your product and service presents to customers or to clients, okay? So you think about it for phones, what are some of the value propositions they put out there? They'll talk about our battery lasts for three days. We have a 50 megapixel camera. We have 6G technology in our phone. They're putting some of those capabilities in there to talk about that. How would those things address certain people's needs? Well, oh, I work and travel a lot, so battery time is gonna be more. Oh, I make these YouTube videos, so having the, the camera that works and is so much nicer might help me there. We start seeing these things right there, and so you wanna put out those opportunities, right? You wanna put out those capabilities of our products, what they can do, what they can offer. 
And another thing you can look at is what is the impact that your product is going to have on that customer? You know, like if you ever watch the late night infomercials, they always have the exercise programs, right? Do the workout DVDs, do the pump flex or whatever. But what they show you, what do they show you? They show you the before and the after. They're showing you the impact. That is a value proposition. We can help you lose 30 pounds. We can help you feel like you're 18 again. They're letting you know what the impact that their product can have on you. And that is a value proposition. And the thing is, is whenever you're given these value propositions, it's important to have proof of that proposed impact. That's why those, you know, old P90X videos from 20 years ago were so good because they show the before and the after and people do it. It's like, look, you don't have to listen to me. Look at the results. Okay. Look at Bob, the farmer, look at Sarah, the, the, the single housewife, you know, whatever you have these kind of things out there and they're showing that you're like, Hey, I get it. I'm starting to see that. And that's why it's important when you're thinking about kind of general things that can help out, you might want to think about the cost savings that are out there by your product, right? Or, or maybe the, the value that your product can add to people, how it can make people's lives easier, what it's better for. And that's, that's really important that you know how to do it. But the thing is, is however you put your value proposition out there, you really need to make it in a way that people can understand. Because if I tell you, oh, well, you can use 70% less electricity in our light bulbs. Well, do you know how much money one light bulb costs? Like here, I'm turning this on. How much money am I saving if I turn this off? So I save 70% of whatever that was. I'm not really sure what that means. Like, okay, my electrical bill will be down 70%. I can understand that. But one light bulb, I'm not really sure. So what might be better is, hey, you know what? This light bulb, our new light bulbs, they'll last for seven years. Whereas our old light bulbs, they only last, they only last apparently two years, right? And so we see that. So put in a terms that your customers can really understand. And the thing is, is when you're developing these value propositions, make sure you decide on which market you're going to focus on with that value proposition. And you might see this in advertising for kids movies. They'll have the ads that really appeal to the little kids, right? They're like, oh, it's got action and laughs and, and you know, toilet humor and stuff like that. But then they'll have the value proposition for the parents, right? They'll have, oh, it has the funny adult jokes and stuff like that. You know, like that's where the whole Shrek things kind of worked out for people. Because yeah, kids had their stuff and then we had things for adults as well. So everybody could be happy. So it's the number one movie in America 20 years ago, right? And so you think about those things, but it's really important to kind of differentiate the different market segments that are out there and develop value propositions for each one because we might need to do that because you might see that look we have to have a different value proposition for the different influencers in the purchase right because think about it for colleges they have the value proposition for the students right and what is that oh we've got good dorms we've got good food we've got fun classes you're gonna make a lot of friends you have a good time when you're here that's what they want those are the value propositions that are gonna work for the students but what about the parents that are paying for the school? Oh, hey, your kid's gonna get a good education. They're gonna be safe when they're here. They're gonna get a job when they're out of school, right? And so that for that, the parents are like, oh, did you say job? Do you mean they might move out of my house so I can turn their bedroom into my workshop? Hmm, and you can see the daydreams popping up all around, right? And so the thing is, you have to realize is each different market will have a different value proposition or propositions that really appeals to them. That means it is super important that you research your different markets. What's really important to them? Determine what that is and make sure you're developing value propositions that link up to that. And so when you do this research, really figure out what it is that's going to kind of click for each one of these segments with those value propositions so you can develop those things that's going to resonate with them okay so if it's like if it's like in diet food kind of stuff is that people are looking for lower calories or are they looking for gluten free or are they looking for dairy free or are they looking for low fat are they looking for low sodium there's different things people might look for right and so you can look at it and say wow there's a different value proposition for a lot of people because yeah you might look at it, oh no sugar means there's more fat no fat means more sugar oh what am i supposed to do you see there's different things people might target, okay? So do your research to figure out what it is that's really appealing to these people and what's really gonna have the most value to them. And that's why when you do that, look at your product or service and kind of see what you're gonna be offering. And in terms of what your overall value propositions are overall, is there anything that kind of links up with what these customers are looking for? Because when you start to see that crossover, we know that that's the value proposition we need to be focusing on with that group. 
So what does that mean? Well, for you, it means you really need to define those benefits. I mean, write out the value propositions, write out those things so you have them down there. So if someone comes in and you're selling cars, you say, oh, there's a family coming in that needs room for six kids. Well, what's the value proposition we need to sell for them? What product links up with what they need? Have those things down and you'll see that if you go to Best Buy or if you're in Germany, you go to Saturn or something like that, you'll actually see when they sell their computers, there's a little piece of paper next to the computer that talks about, oh, here Here's the RAM, the ROM, here's the capacity, here's the, the Intel chip inside, how fast it is, here's the memory it has, here's the weight of it. They put all those there because they know, hey, for some people, those things are really important. So if we can list those things out, we need to list them out. Because you never know. Sometimes you don't know it. Like, I don't know which value proposition is going to work best for them. That's why you lay it out. That's why on your website and stuff like that, you really want to stipulate Hey, these are our value propositions. This is what our product brings to you. This is what our service can offer to you. Here's how we can help you. Here can we solve your problems. Here can we, how we can help you grow. We're putting those things out there and by listing all those things, it makes it a lot easier to kind of let people know. And the thing is, is when you're doing all these value propositions, you also need to look at the alternatives that are out there. I mean, what is your competition doing? What is their value proposition? Because if all of a sudden you're offering the same value as them, you're just kind of doubling up on them. Does that help so much? Because you think about it in fast food, there's different value propositions that stores or, or restaurants are giving, right? McDonald's, it's the fast standardization. That's the big value proposition for them, right? Burger King, you're away right away. Culver's, hey, it's the Wisconsin family fun cheesiness, right? They all have a little bit something different because if we put out a value proposition that, hey, we're the fast standardized food, well, I've already got McDonald's for that. Oh, well, well we're that farmer's aw shucks cheesiness. Oh, Culver's has that. You really need to figure out is what's our value proposition? How are we gonna make it a little bit different or at least find our niche out there when we are developing our value propositions? Now, some of the things will cross over. Look, our food is tasty like Culver's, you know, you can look at that but you have to think about it in terms of what are the alternatives out there that are being offered to our potential clients. And we need to help them realize that we're offering more value than our competitors. And that's why it is really important that you give your audience that proof of your value proposition. That's why when they show that cheese pizza coming out and they pull the cheese, you always see the cheesy gooiness going out, like, oh, doesn't that look good? Or they show the people happily eating that bacon, egg and cheese biscuit. Mm, mm, mm. my morning is so much better. They're doing it in their ads to really show you the value, right? They're giving you that example. That's why people really like reviews and ratings because like, look, that's someone that actually got some value out of that hotel. That's someone that enjoyed their stay at that, you know, eating at that restaurant or staying at that hotel. That's why they have those things to help reinforce what those value propositions are, okay? So I hope this helps you understand what value propositions are because honestly, these are one of the key things you need to know in marketing and sales to get people to understand why your product and service is perfect for them. So I wish you all the best and have a great day. Hey there fellow marketers, Mark here. And today we're gonna to talk about are the different types of marketing, okay? Like product marketing or service marketing or cause marketing, these kind of things. We're gonna talk about those different types of marketing because there's different ways you do market based on what you're trying to sell. Whether you're trying to sell an idea or a service or a product, there's different things about that. So I think before we can really get really in depth into the marketing field, you kinda of need to know the basic types of marketing. And probably the biggest one, the one that you know the most when you think of when you think of marketing, is product marketing. We're trying to sell products. So how do I market a Walters World quarter zip? Huh? How do I get people to buy this? How do I market a Microsoft service? How do I sell this product? And so you kind of think about the different ways to do that. And you know, we have the product, price, place, promotion, kind of marketing, marketing mix stuff we think about. And we kind of think about all those different things that relate to those products. So if I'm talking about my quarter zip, I might talk about how comfortable it is, how warm it keeps me in the cool weather here in the Midwest and stuff like that, how it's nicely embroidered, not one of those iron on things. No, this is a nice one and so what you're trying to do is really find some of the value propositions of that product itself and you market that and you're trying to sell that product so you might have hey try this food first have you ever noticed when you know McDonald's comes out with a new product or, or Walmart has a new little thing they might have free samples or a discount or buy one get one free just to inspire people to try it yeah these are different things you're gonna do to market a product okay so there's that kind of product stuff. so you have all these things involved there now on the other side of things you have services right you have a 
accounting services, you have education, things like this. How do I market services? And so we have to think about these things. How do I market accounting? What do I need to do to get people to buy that? Because I can't, they can't hold on. I mean, you can hold your accountant, you can give them a hug, but you can't hold the accounting service, right? And so when we're trying to market those services, we have to think about this. That's why you'll see for amusement parks, like you can't hold on to an amusement park ride, but you can, but you, you have to be there to feel it. And so in order to market that, what we're going to do is we'll have advertisements showing people going, Whoa! going down the amusement parks, going down the roller coasters, showing people having fun. They'll show you that. That's why you'll see a lot of lawyers, which is a service. How do they market that? Oh, we've saved people billions or we've made people billions. And they're trying to show, look, this is what we've done. So you understand what you're going to get. Okay. So product marketing and service marketing are two biggest kinds of marketing that you actually see in your real life. But the thing is, there's other marketing. Have you ever heard of person marketing? Hey, whenever there's a politician going up for election, that is person marketing. And what you're trying to do in person marketing is you're trying to get a positive opinion about a specific person, usually a political candidate, right? Oh, vote for Bob because he's a great guy. Vote for Bob because he's a family man. Vote for Bob because of this. And you're trying to give reasons for people to believe in that candidate, to want to vote for that candidate, okay? Now, another thing you might want to think about, though, is also place marketing. Ever wonder why your favorite Instagrammers are always like, oh, I'm here at Coachella. Oh, I'm here in Austin or I'm here in Chicago. And they always had that sponsored post from visit Chicago or visit Memphis or whatever. Well, the thing is in place marketing, we're trying to inspire people to go to a destination. So you'll see this a lot in tourism, but also you could kind of think of it for a mall. They need, I mean, malls are having a tough time right now. We got to think of a way is how do we market this place so people want to come here, right? And so you have to think about those things. And that's why in place marketing, you do see a lot of those influencers, those Instagram influencers, because they're trying to get people to go place, just show pictures of this place. I mean, think about it. Like it could be, you know, Kazakhstan's really popular now and Belize was popular before that and Iceland before that in Portugal before that they showed all this kind of stuff so you wanted to go there I mean how many places have you been inspired to go because you watched a travel video because you saw something cool on an Instagram feed I mean if you do have some put it down below so we can hear some of the places they've done a good job of marketing a place I know for me, probably the state that's done the best job in the US to market themselves is Michigan. Their whole pure Michigan taglines, they have great stuff to show you all the outdoor stuff there. It's on the license plates for the city. They do it on digital. It's really cool to inspire you to go there. Okay. Next thing you have is what's called cause marketing and causes are causes that people believe in. Okay. You remember when there was the ALS ice bucket challenge? Yes. That was kind of marketing for a cause. And so let people know about a cause. Okay. So, Hey, we dumped the ice bucket to let people know about ALS. You ever seen the pink ribbons for breast cancer awareness or the red ribbons for AIDS awareness? That is marketing. That is cause marketing, letting people know because sometimes people don't know about an issue. I mean, ALS, I mean, it made no money. It didn't, nobody donated nothing like that no one really knew about it, what it was until that challenge they let people know about it so people knew about the cause now another marketing that type of market that goes really kind of in sync with that with that kind of cause marketing is organization marketing so organization marketing is when the Red Cross is marketing to try to you know get people to donate money I know every year we go to the Eastern Illinois Food Bank prom and they raise money for the, the shelters here in town and the food banks here in Eastern Illinois to help families out like we're doing something so people will donate money. It's not just believe in the cause. This one's about getting people to donate because it's really tough. I mean, everyone feels bad. Everyone wants to help, but getting people to actually put pen to paper on that check to put money in the, in the, in the bucket and ring those bells and stuff like that to get people to put money in isn't easy. So we have to think about is how do we market for that? And those are some of the types of marketing you may see. And each one will call for a different way to do things, a different way to market things, to price things, to promote things, where you sell and all kinds of stuff like that. So you do need to think about that. So I hope this is a nice little first step into the different types of marketing. And I hope you enjoy the rest of our videos so you can learn how to market to all those different areas and all those different types of marketing so you can help out your company, your firm, your organization, your candidate, your call your organization, your whatever. So I wish you luck. I hope you liked the video. If you do, hit that like button, give us a thumbs up. And if you want to get more business videos, maybe YouTube help videos, all kinds of stuff, click that subscription bell, hit that notification bell, and you'll get our videos in your feed whenever we put new ones out. Anyway, I wish you all the best. Bye and good luck. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today I wanna to talk about something. And really what I wanna talk about is the different idea of what sellers think about why people buy 
versus what buyers think when they're actually buying. Because we have these kind of ideas why we think people are buying our products, but then there's the truth that's kind of behind that. And so I wanna kind of talk about four different truths that we as sellers should really know. Because I know a lot of us, when we think about why are people buying our stuff? Well, they think, well, people buy because of us because of our relationship. They're buying from us because we're cool people, right? Well, yes, relationships are important when it comes to sales, but it's not because you're cool. They're not buying because the relationship. They're buying because by having that relationship, I know where you live. I know where you do business. I know who you are. And so if things don't work out, I know where to bring my problems. I know where to bring my issues. And so it's that effect that people have. That's why we're buying with them. I know what I'm going to get. I know what to do if something goes wrong. I know how you're going to react. That's the truth behind it. The idea that they're buying just because of our relationship, well, think about it. Do you buy the same stuff from the place you have the best relationship every single day? No, there's other influences out there. But the relationship does help. I'm not going to say that, but that's not everything, okay? A lot of it just has to do with the fact that they can trace everything back to you if there's any issues, okay? And the next thing people tell themselves they want to believe is, Ah, people buy from us because we're the cheapest. If we have the cheapest prices out there, people are going to come to us no matter what. Well, the thing is, we're not necessarily buying from you because you're the cheapest. What we're buying the cheapest thing for is that, look, if things go bad, at least I didn't waste any money on it. I got the cheapest thing possible. I mean, think about it. When we go on trips, we go into the dollar store and buy toys for our kids. Why? Well, if they lose them or they get broken or they get taken, we're now out any money, okay? We're out the lowest amount of money possible. And so it's that whole idea of, at least I didn't overpay. That's the true essence of people buy the cheapest. No, they're not buying because they're the cheapest. They're buying because they don't wanna, they wanna be out the least amount of stuff. It's a different kind of mental perspective when you're looking at sales. Another one you see is, oh, they buy from us because our products have the most features available. I mean, how many of you have seen an ad for a car where it has all the options on there? Oh, the spoiler, the sports package, Apple Play, DVD player, Bluetooth all inside, Wi-Fi enabled, all these great features. Yeah, it's great. But is that why you're really buying the product? Well, no, I'm buying the product because it's a car and I like the design. The features are nice, but they're not the end all be all. And what's what you have to realize is when it comes to features for actual purchasers, look, the idea is, look, I'm not going to use all those features. What might be getting me to buy is the thought that maybe one day I might use that feature. I mean, think about it. When I was buying cars in my 20s, I wasn't really looking to buy something that had car seats or space for car seats for kids, you know, but later on I was. And so what I was looking for, the features I was looking for were different. Well, right now, if I'm looking to buy a car, what am I looking for? Well, the features I'm looking for, hmm, well, I'm not going to really use the, the teen driver feature yet, but my son is 13, so maybe I could use that eventually and give him that car so it could be a feature I might use in the future. There is that kind of idea behind the features, but it's not just because you have all the features that are going to get people to buy. It's the features that really resonate with people for different reasons, okay? So it's not all the features that matter. It's the specific features. That's why it's important you really figure out these value propositions, what's really important to all these different clients that are going to come there so you can reinforce which features are really going to be working for them. And the last idea I want to get across to you is this idea that sellers think that, oh, people are going to buy from us because we're the best. Yeah, it doesn't hurt that you make the best product out there, but they're not buying from you because you're the best. The truth why they're buying is because, look, if I buy the best in the market, my boss can't come back and say, oh, why don't you get something better? I mean, think about it. How many times in sports do you hear athletes blame, oh, my helmet or the bat or the ball or whatever, the rim wasn't, the rim wasn't forgiving today. Like, look, if we had the best rim, if we have the best baseball, we have the best helmets, the best equipment, there's no other excuse out there, right? And so that's the idea behind it. And there used to be this saying, you don't get fired for buying IBM. Why? Because IBM was the best when it came to hardware and computers and all these systems like that. So look, you couldn't have a mess up because it can't get any better. And so that's what you have to think about. Look, we're not buying because you're the best. We're buying because there's not a better option out there. So we're going to do what we can to make sure there's not that little doubt we have that maybe if I would have bought that better one, it would have worked out better. That's what you're fighting against. Okay, so I just want to kind of give you these kind of four realities, these four truths that salespeople should know when they are selling. Because really it is, when you think about why people buy, 
A lot of times we think of it from our own perspective, but we have to think about it from that purchaser's perspective. If we, because we know what they're really buying for, then we can address those issues and let them know that, hey, we can help you out. If it is, look, hey, we are the cheapest car lot in town, so worst comes to worst, you're at the least amount of money. It's okay. Come down to Mark's used car service. We'll take care of you. You know, these kind of things. All right. So I wish y'all the best, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers and salespeople. Professor Walters here, and today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make your life a lot easier. I'm gonna tell you the two reasons why people actually buy your products or your services. There's really only two reasons out there, and it's not because, oh, we are the cheapest, or we're the best, or we're this or that. No, these two reasons are pretty straightforward. One, they have a problem and you can solve it. Or two, they see that your product could help them be more successful. That's what it comes down to. And if you look at it one by one, if we look at this, they have a problem thing. Like if I see I have a problem and I see that your product can help me solve that problem, now I'm gonna buy because you're helping me solve that problem. So for salespeople, what do we need to do? We need to make sure we stipulate all the ways that our products, our services can help people, right? Can we help solve your problems? Hey, you have a problem with your marketing class? Watch Professor Walter's video so you can see it a fun way and learn it better. Okay, I'm solving your problems for learning your marketing, right? You do these things. And the thing is, you see this time and time again with different companies, consulting firms, what do they do? Well, the firm sees that, look, we're bleeding money. We need to figure out what these inefficiencies are. We need to fix our problems. Hey, KPMG, Deloitte. Maybe you could help us. Maybe you could do these things for us. Yes, and that's why KPMG and Deloitte, all these, all these auditing firms and all these consulting firms, like, look, we can help you through fixing your problems, okay? Because they're doing that. Or you can look at it in terms of, hey, you know, we need to make our customers happy. We see our customers are complaining about things. What can we do? Well, if you look at Burger King, people are asking for, hey, we would like some non-meat alternatives. And what happened? Well, a supplier came and said, hey, look, we can solve your problems. You wanna offer a non-meat burger? We can offer you our impossible meat so you can have your impossible Whopper and solve that problem of not having a non-meat burger. And if you think about this, this really boils down to a lot of just really core things. If you have a problem, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm bored, all these kind of things, those are the true problems people have. And so if our products or our services can solve that problem, there's a better chance they're gonna buy from us. So make sure you're saying like, figuring out what are all the problems that are out there that our product or service can solve and make sure you're you know, stipulating, you're laying out all those things out there so people can see that, oh, this could be the right thing for me. And that second reason is they really see that your product or service is an opportunity for them to grow. They see that, wait, if I use this product with us, this will help us grow our business even more. So it's not necessarily they have a problem, but they see as, hey, you could be that boost to take us farther. So if you look at that audit and that consulting company, yeah, before they had a problem, we were gonna help it, but now we can look at it and say, hey, look, we can help you boost your business. Things are already going well, we can make it go even better, okay? And so you're laying these things out. You're explaining how you can actually boost growth and help them grow more. So this could be with iPhones, right? Apple's like, look, we can help your business do even better by helping you sell more of the new iPhone 4000 or whatever. And so we really need to lay out is how does our product or how do our services really help with that growth opportunity and so you're laying those things out. And that's why when you're looking at sales, value propositions are the most important thing that you need to know because then you can enunciate these things, you can announce these things, you can promote these things to your potential customers to let them know how you can help solve all those different problems they might have and to give them an opportunity to grow with your products and services. So I hope this helps you realize the actual like, two reasons why people buy. One, because you have a problem, or two, you see there's an opportunity for growth. From there, everything else comes from that, okay? So I wish y'all the best. Good luck selling your products and services anywhere you are, and I wish y'all the best. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers. Professor Walters here, and today we're in Vicenza, Italy, and today we're gonna talk about is probably one of the most key elements of marketing, and that is the marketing mix. The four Ps of marketing. Product, price, place, promotion and each one of these things are key to any marketer understanding their market what they're going to do how they're going to succeed and so let's go through these four kind of basic topics to get started now you first off you have your product right now your product 
captures value. It's something that people really want. And the thing is, a product isn't just a thing. It's not just, you know, a phone or something like that. It could be a service. It could be an idea. Any of these things that people feel is valuable, that's creating it. That's something people that, it's something they want. Whether it's I want a hot dog or I want some bigly pasta here in Vicenza, there's something that people want to have. And there's things we can do to kind of increase the value that we create with our products. I mean, think about it. If you have kind of a basic car, you know, a two-door car that's really tiny that doesn't have a lot of power, you don't expect to spend a lot of money on that, do you? No. But if you have a car with nice seats in it and a good stereo and all kinds of stuff like that, you're like, yeah, I, I like this a bit better. That's creating more value for me. I really want this more. And so you can do those things. Think about services. If you're a better company at delivering a good service, aren't you willing to pay more money for a restaurant that gives you good service than a restaurant that gives you bad service? So we can create value that way. So that's your product, okay? Now, the next thing we look at are the prices. And price is actually how we actually capture value. What does it actually represent? How much do people value these things that we're doing? And the thing is, how many of you have been inspired to buy something because of the price? Oh, buy one, get one free? Sure, I'll get that. Or it's 50% off? Sure, I'll buy that. Price is really an important thing. And as a marketer, you can use that to market your products. Hey, we're the dollar store. Hello, you have these kind of things. You have that. And so when you're looking at price, you gotta realize is price is different things. Like there's actually a price that people pay, right? There's the manufacturer suggested retail price. We might look at that. But really price depends on how people value that product, okay? Because I may feel something's worth $10 and you may think it's worth $5. Well, you have different values for those things. And so we gotta find the right price that captures that value for people. Because if you think about it, if I say, hey, I'll give you a two week trip to Italy for $2,000, you're like, Wow, that sounds like a great deal. Well, yeah, if you're flying from Illinois to Italy tomorrow, yeah, 2,000 bucks, that's just gonna be your plane ticket, let alone a hotel and eating and stuff like that. But the thing is, if you're living in Padova or Venice, which is like, you know, 40 minutes away, you're like, why would I spend two grand to go to Vicenza when I can stay at my own house? There's no value there for me. So you really have to think about it in a perspective kind of thing, all right? So think about that. Also, when you think about prices, you want to think about how people think about prices. Historically speaking, I mean, ask a college student what their parents said when they told their parents what the tuition bill was. They're like, oh my God, when I went to school, it was only a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars. And now it's like a couple hundred thousand dollars. Well, yeah, over time, historical prices do change. So that's something you got to think about. And another thing you got to look at is capturing that value with price is sometimes you look at it in terms of, you know, quantity, quality, these kind of things. Like, yeah, if you're going to be flying here to Italy from the U.S., yeah, you can fly economy, no problem. You can fly nonstop Chicago to Venice, easiest pie, but you're going to pay more than if you fly to Paris first and then fly to Venice, okay? So we realize that, hmm, people value that direct flight more than taking a connector flight. So we can charge more for that, okay? So you see those things out there. Also, people are willing to pay more money for business class or first class because they get, you know, maybe better service or better food or more leg room so I have plenty of space so when I get here and I feel relaxed. So we look at those things, okay? When you're looking at capturing those values, okay? Now, the third P we're looking at is place. That is delivering the value. How are we gonna deliver that value? Well, you think about it. Think about the retail places you're gonna sell your product in. Won't that influence how it's perceived? If I'm selling it at a cheap store, it's gonna be perceived as cheap. If I sell it at a high-end store, it's gonna be seen as a higher-end, more quality product. And so we have those things. Think about your website. Do you buy stuff from a website that looks kind of shady? Heck no, you don't do that. You're like, I, it's gotta look legit for me to give them my credit card. That's also part of delivering the value. But also, how do we deliver the value of a good night's sleep at a hotel, right? We have to think about that. What goes all into that? Oh, having good beds, nice pillows, quiet walls, maybe not near a street or thick windows to block the sound. We have to think about all those things that we need to do in order to deliver the value to people, to that place, okay? And then the fourth P is promotion. We need to promote our goods, right? We need to promote our products. And promotion is communicating that value. We need to let people know. I mean, think about it. Has there ever been a concert you heard about after the concert happens? Or a friend of yours was in town and you found out 
after they post their pictures on Instagram. You're like, wait, you were in town? I didn't even know. Well, the same problem happens for companies. We've got to communicate that value. Let people know when the concert is. Let them know what kind of food we have at that restaurant. Because if people don't know what Bob's restaurant has, they probably won't go there because they don't know what Bob's is serving. And the thing is that fourth P, that promotion, is probably the most common thing people think about when they think of the four P's of marketing. When they think of marketing in general, they think of more the advertising side of things, right? We're communicating to the customer. We're promoting to the customer. But the thing is market is much more than just advertising. Market is creating those new products, right? We're trying to figure out what to make, so the first P. We're also trying to figure out how we price things for pricing kind of stuff, capturing what it's really worth for people. We have that. Deciding where we're gonna sell and how we're gonna sell things, that's that place thing, delivering the value. All these things go together to make our marketing mix. And what you need to realize is all these are important for when you're trying to sell your products or promote your products, whether it's ads or stuff like that. So I hope this gives you like a nice basic idea of what the marketing mix is, what those four P's are. If it does give you a good idea, hey, give me a thumbs up so I know we're doing a good job. If it doesn't, just leave a comment down below or something like that so you have an idea there. Uh, but I hope this does help to give you an idea of the four P's of marketing. If you wanna learn more about marketing, hit that subscribe button. We've had all kinds of marketing videos, business videos, YouTube help videos on this channel because we're trying to help marketers out there, business students out there. We're trying to help new entrepreneurs and YouTubers and all kinds of people do a better job of marketing themselves and being part of the business world and maybe helping you get a better grade on the exam if you're a student. So I uh, do appreciate your likes and your subscriptions and have a great time and I'll say bye from here in Vicenza. Hello there fellow marketers and travelers. Dr. Mark Walters here from the Walters World Travel website and today what we have for you is kind of a little overview of the four P's of marketing in terms of digital marketing in terms of selling Iceland. So let's get started. Now if you're not sure what the four P's of marketing are, there is product, price, place and promotion. Now, if we look at this in terms of Iceland tourism, you have the products. And the product of Iceland, these are the things that create value, the reasons why you wanna go there. You've got the Blue Lagoon, the thermal hot springs that are here. You could go see icebergs, you can go horseback riding. There's all kinds of products and services on offer here that create value for people that make them want to visit. So that's the product side of it. Now, the next thing we look at is the price and price captures the value. How much is a horseback ride in Iceland worth? How much is a trip to a thermal bath the Blue Lagoons actually cost for you? And that's another thing that companies have to figure out is what's the right cost for this? What's the right price? And that's another thing that people have to figure out is what's the right price for our customers, okay? Now, the third P we look at is place. Now, when we look at place, this is how we deliver the value of our products or services to our clients. Now, to enjoy the icebergs here in Iceland, well, you probably need to be in Iceland to see them. To feel the calming effects of the Blue Lagoon and the thermal spas, you need to be in Iceland. So sometimes it's hard if you're having services and these things to be able to, to deliver to customers that aren't there because you need to be here in Iceland for that. So what you see in terms of digital marketing for Iceland, they do a great job of developing their websites in order to sell to people from all over the world. So the website is a new place where you deliver the value to the customer. You need to be able to sell your product and service on your website. We see companies in Iceland using their websites to deliver the value of coming to Iceland to customers so it can inspire them to come here. For example, the Blue Lagoon, their website is very helpful. It's in multiple languages. You can book your times to come in advance. They'll help you figure out the best bus or taxi ride to get to the, the hot springs from Reykjavik or from the airport. They're doing everything they can to help deliver that value for you. And the thing is, when we look at delivering value, sometimes it's giving our customers other options. For example, for 45 euros at the Blue Lagoon, you just get to go and lay there. Ah, but for 60, euros you get a towel and a drink and a facial scrub well the thing is do I need a facial scrub well my face is already pretty enough so maybe not um, do I need you know a, a free drink well who doesn't like a free drink especially here in Iceland where it's kind of expensive but what really got me to buy the 60 euro package versus 45 is the fact that it did offer a towel 
I'm here on vacation. Therefore, I don't pack towels with me when I go on vacation when I'm flying. So them giving that to me actually added value. And so we start to see as we see the product and the prices and all these things kind of merging together because we want to deliver value to our customers. What's going to deliver them, make them happier about getting their product? Oh, a towel there. Well, the towel can be an add-on to our product. You get to go to the Blue Lagoon and relax and you get a towel for that extra service. And I value that towel so they have an increased price for it. So it's 60 euros versus 45 euros. You see how all these things kind of interact together? And then if we look at the fourth P of marketing, and this is one of the things that they do really great with their digital marketing here in Iceland, when we talk about that website presence, is the promotion side of it. Promoting Iceland, promoting traveling throughout the country on the websites. On, you know, if you go on Facebook and you start talking about Iceland, you're going to see commercials show up on the side. You'll see commercials on YouTube and these kind of things. And they have this great online presence for when you want to purchase for that place side of things. But also they do a great job of promoting online because most people aren't passing by billboards anymore saying, let's go to Iceland. No, they're looking for these deals. They're looking for these things. And they're doing a great job of promoting, for example, some of the airlines here will let you fly into Iceland from the U.S., stay there for a couple of days, and then fly off to Europe from there for free. It's like, wait, I can stop in Iceland and do these things? I didn't know that. So they're promoting that and then giving people more value because they're creating value. Now you're not just going to Paris, you're going to Iceland and Paris. And all of that can really add value to customers. And when you look at digital marketing and how it kind of comes into effect of it, you can offer products on a, a digital products. For example, maybe you want an Icelandic phrase book. Or if you look at the guidebooks in terms of pricing, well, they'll price well. If you want the, the you know actual book, it's $27. Oh, but if you want the PDF version, it's $9. Okay, now you look at this. Why is that there? How does this price affect it? If we look into pricing, there's a lot of the things that go into it. Obviously, the cost. It costs more to make the book than just reprint a PDF. But there's a lot of things that get involved with pricing. You got your customers, you got to look at what do they expect to pay. Your competition, what is everyone else charging? Okay, everybody in your supply chain, your channels, they need to make money. There's a lot of things that are going on out there that are going to influence the pricing. Okay. Now those are just some of the things I saw in terms of the four piece of marketing and the really great things they're doing with digital marketing here in Iceland. If you want to learn more, you can go check out our website, waldersworld.com, or you can learn more online. There's all kinds of great programs like on Coursera and other places. Anyway, I wish you all the best and bless bless. That's bye bye here in Iceland. Bye from Reykjavik. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Walters, and today we're going to talk about the four piece of marketing. We're going to focus on the product. We're here in Reykjavik, Iceland, and traveling in Iceland is fantastic. And when you look at the product side of the four P's, the product creates value. These are things that people want to have, the reasons why people are buying. And you need to look at the, all the different reasons that are out there. So if we look at some of the products in terms of tourism here in Iceland, you have the Blue Lagoon. Now, the Blue Lagoon is a thermal hotspot. Okay? Okay, it's where the thermal hot water comes up and you can relax in the mineral waters and rub mud on yourself and it's great. And the product there they have, they actually have multiple versions of selling the same product. Okay, and that's one thing when you look at products, you can sell one product many different ways. So they'll have their standard package which just lets you into the, the, to the spa and then you can go and, and be in the water. Oh, the next level up, oh, it comes with a drink and a towel. The next level up is drink, towel, slippers, robe, and a free massage. The next one, oh, gives you a, a dinner. And what they do in terms of the product is every step they're adding more value to it, there's more things that people are gonna want for it. And if we look at some of the kind of traditional things that we look at in terms of products and how they can change and add value in different ways, sometimes we look at the quantity. You know, if you ever buy a six pack of beer instead of a single beer, oh, you get kind of a price difference or, or quantity discounts and these kind of things. You can buy in bigger bulk. Also, if you look in terms of cars, well, if you get in a Mercedes, you know it's got the leather seats and nice stereo system versus my Ford Flex, which has got seats and that's an important thing out there. And so we see how you can have different parts of a product 
add value. Now the thing in terms of adding this value and finding the product attributes that are important to clients, you need to do some market research to find out what's more important to them. Because if you're selling, you know, if I'm selling here in Iceland, what's important to people? Hey, I want to make sure I can get there. So what do they do? The airlines here actually have started up more cheap airlines and they give free layovers if you're flying through Iceland. So you can stay here a couple days on your trip from Boston to Paris so you can get Iceland in there. So it's not just seeing France, you're seeing Iceland and France. And seeing that other country can add value to the client. And that's what we're looking for in doing, is creating that value, finding reasons for people to buy. So I hope that helps you out. If you want to learn more, you can check us out on our website at waltersworld.com or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash waltersworld. Please subscribe to learn more. Anyway, we wish you all the best and bye from Reykjavik. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're gonna to talk about one of the four Ps of marketing, and that is price. And what you have to realize is when you're coming up with a price, what you're really doing is capturing value. You figure out is how much is something worth to people. That's how we have a price. What is the true value of it? And the thing is, when we look at it, we have to realize this price is all the things that people are gonna give up to obtain our product or service, to kind of believe in our idea. We have to think about these things. What's the time it takes? What's the money they're gonna spend? What's the effort they have to put into doing things? The energy they have to use to make it happen? All these things out there, we're trying to capture all that. Right? We're trying to figure out what is this all worth, okay? And the thing is, when we look at price and we look at capturing value, what we have to realize is that the perception of value is different by person. I mean, think about it. If I tell you, hey, I'll give you a $2,000 ticket to London, well, is that a good price or a bad price? Well, if you're living in Germany, that's a horrible price. You can fly for like 50 euros to get there, or $50 to get there. I mean, it's next to nothing. But what if you're coming from the US and you're going there in the summer? Oh, well, hmm. last year when I got a ticket, it was like $1,300. But if I went in the fall, it was only 600. So 2000 still seems like a lot. So for me, that's not really a good value. So I'm gonna keep searching for other plane ticket prices. But what if I tell you this, for $2,000, you get a flight from here in the US to London. You get seven nights in a hotel, a five-star hotel, and tickets to the hottest show in the West End. Oh, well, that's a little different because those nice hotels can be like $500 a night. And, and going to see one of the best shows in the West End, 200, 300 pounds, so 200, $500 maybe for tickets. So, wow, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now we're kind of changing my perception of if this is a good value or not. So what we need to do is really kind of think about is, how do customers come up with their perception of prices? So one thing you might look at is what is their historical perspective? So for example, if you tell me two grand to go to London, I'm like, yeah, that seems a bit high because I went for a grand last year and the year before that I went for like 700 bucks. And if I went in October, it's only like $500. So I'm using my historical kind of perspective in order to gauge if I think this is a good value or not. And here's the thing, if you're selling products, right, that people don't buy very often, they buy every five years or 10 years, or 20 years think about a college education you bought it for yourself and then you buy it for your kids 20 years down the road well of course you're gonna have a little bit of sticker shock because your historical perspective is a price from 20 years before so you got to think about that now the next thing you have to think about is actually look at these substitute products that are out there because your customers what they're gonna do is say look this is the price for that flight to London right well what are my alternatives how else could I get there well if you're in the US you could take the QE2 and you could take the boat to go there that costs, I don't know, 10 grand maybe, and that will take you a week to get there, maybe? Huh, seven hours flight or a week in a boat, and I get boat sick. Um, maybe not, maybe that's not right for me. So that's gonna influence their kind of perception of value. Also, you might look at people's ability to pay. Look, it doesn't matter what the price is. I can't afford a ticket to London. I don't have the money for that. That's gonna influence their value. Whereas on the other side, if you have money, you're like, oh, well, that price isn't too bad because I have that extra money laying around. I could buy that. I mean, think about it. When you have extra money left over, you're like, what else could I spend it on? What else could I buy? It's a very different perception you have of what a price is when you don't have any cash. Because when you're broke, hey, you know, you're, you're 
you're thinking things a lot differently than when if you're flush with money. Another thing they might look at in terms of perception for pricing, they might look at the quantity or the quality of the stuff they're going to buy. So if I say it's $2,000 to fly to London, you're like, man, that's kind of expensive. Well, yeah, for basic economy, that is expensive. But for first class, wow, that's actually a pretty good deal to get first class where I get to lay down and sleep and they just give me all the wine and fancy food I've ever wanted. That's awesome. For two grand, yes, that actually is a good value because you're getting a lot of quality for that $2,000. Or you might look at it in terms of quantity. Maybe they're charging you something like, man, that seems like a lot, but wow, I get six months for the price of two months? Okay, maybe I will do that. That's why you have those kind of introductory pricing deals. Like, look, it's worth $500, but we'll give it to you for your first month for $10.99. You're like, hey, that's that's a good deal. I'm, get, I'm getting a lot for a little there. Okay, that's kind of worth it. That's gonna influence people's perception of value. And the thing is, you might see it in different ways, because if you're a college student watching this in the fall, it's hilarious because I know in the fall there will be deals for laptops and probably a deal for some console gaming system, whatever the newest Nintendo or Xbox or PlayStation is. It'll probably be, oh, if you buy this new Dell computer for your school person, you will then get a free Nintendo as well. And you're like, well, that price is, you know, it's, it's a grand for that computer, but I get a $300 Nintendo? Hmm. Well, maybe I will get it. And that's what you're kind of looking at. You're trying to figure out is, what is people's perception of value? How much do they value something in general? What are they willing to pay for it? Are there things that influence it? And we as marketers, when we're looking at that P of price, is we're really trying to figure out is, what are all the things that go into it, into the value that people perceive for our products, so we can capture that and we can find a price, an actual, you know, $5.99 or $2,000 or whatever, that really represents that value that people are getting. Okay, so I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about the four Ps. If you want to know more, we've got other videos just on each of the other three of the four Ps. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're here in New Orleans, Louisiana, right on one of the balconies. No, we're not on Bourbon Street. It's not kind of a crazy place like that. Um, but today we're gonna to talk about are actually one of the four Ps of marketing, and that is the place or delivering the value or delivering the value proposition. Because we have to figure out is what's the base way for us to get our product, our service, or whatever value we're creating to our customers. So you're looking at what different channels are we gonna use? Are we gonna have a website to deliver stuff? Are we gonna have it so people can order through Twitter? Are we gonna have it a storefront? Do we sell it direct by mail? Do we make an infomercial? What do we do? And so we're looking at all the different kind of channels that are out there and how we're gonna basically get that value we create to our customers. Because there's a lot of things you really have to think about when it comes to delivering that value. It's probably the thing that comes up the most for a lot of people is just looking at the website in general, okay? Are we making a good website, an easy to read website, a very manageable website, kind of an intuitive website that people understand? Because the better you make your website, the simpler and more intuitive it is, the more value it can bring to people quicker and so they can buy, buy your products faster and that can really add some value. And thus making it easier to deliver the value to your customers. Now, when you think of delivering the value, probably the biggest thing that comes up though is actually the supply chain. Because when you look at your supply chain, you have to think about it is we have to figure out our, our correct delivery. Are we gonna get it there on time? I mean, Domino's pizza, 30 minutes or less. We gotta figure out is how do we deliver that value in that time in terms of how are we gonna cook our pizza? What kind of pizzas are we gonna have on offer? What about our delivery? Where are our locations gonna be? Because you think about it, another thing that kind of goes along with this place is also looking at the coverage. Have you ever noticed that if you order pizza and you're like in a certain town, oh yeah, it's free delivery, but if you call from like your friend that lives out of town or right across the city limits, they're like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't deliver there. It's because they have to figure out is where is that limit to our coverage we might want to look at, okay? Another thing you might look at in your supply chain is also looking at how we keep our stores stocked. Is it fully stocked? How do we make sure that there's enough Twixes, boxes of Twixes at our store in order to get things done, make sure everyone can get a Twix when they want one, okay? So we have to think about that in terms of inventory management. And with that, you might look at the different assortments that you use, right? Like, do we carry all the lines of Coca-Cola or do we just carry the most popular ones? Because think about it, if you're a gas station, do you have the room, do you have the space for an entire array of Coca-Cola products? Probably not, you'll have the important ones, well, the Coke and Diet Coke and Sprite, and those we have to have. And then the other things we have, 
well, maybe we don't have the cherry vanilla cinnamon coke because it doesn't really work here, okay? It doesn't really fit in our assortment. So we have to think about that in terms of place. Another thing we have to think about is our location. Where are our stores gonna be? Or where are our distribution centers gonna be so we can make sure we're in the right spot? For example, FedEx is based in Memphis, Tennessee. Why? Because it's in the center of the country so they can have all that hub there and go to all kinds of different places. That's one of the things you gotta think about. Another thing you might think of is, ever gone into a restaurant where you walked inside and you wanna just relax and drink and eat and have a nice time? Or you went into a store that really like made you want to shop more? I mean, think of Target. You walk in there and you spend money. You don't know why, but you spend money because they've done a good job of making the place, the store atmosphere, really something that's adding value to you so you don't mind spending the money. So we have to think about those things. And then going back to that supply chain kind of stuff, I really think that kind of your logistics overall, that's gonna fit in your delivery kind of thing. I mean, cause think about it, if you've seen like Pizza Hut commercials and Domino's commercials are talking about, oh, we have this bag that keeps the pizza extra hot when it's there. And we have our own delivery trucks, which keep the pizza piping hot. So when you get there, you have nice hot pizza. Those are kind of things you're putting together in that four piece to make sure you're delivering the value of that hot and tasty pizza, okay? Because having it, the pizza is one thing, but getting to them hot, that's another way you can add value, okay? So I hope this helps you understand that the third P of the four piece of marketing place because you really got to figure out is how we're going to deliver that value proposition to our customers. Anyway, I wish you all the best and bye from here in New Orleans. Hey there, fellow marketers. Have you ever found out that the circus was in town after it left? Or maybe that there was a really cool band that had a concert in your town, but it was last week. And you're like, how did I know about this? Why didn't anybody tell me? This idea of people not knowing what's going on is one of the big reasons why some of the best products out there fail. And this relates to the fourth P of marketing, and that is promotion communicating the value proposition or just communicating the value that our products, our service, our ideas present. Because if people don't know it's out there, does it really exist? I mean, think about it. If I didn't know that a movie was playing at my local cinema, did it actually play there? I mean, you don't know, right? And so that's the thing is we realize when people don't know about the value of a product or what it can do for them, their value propositions, we talked about this in another video, is they don't know why it could be a benefit to them. And that's why it's important for us as marketers to make sure we are promoting, we're communicating the value that our product or service actually provides. You know, for example, my students that are watching this, look, you have this thing called an iCard. It's your ID for the university. Go look up your university ID and put benefits next to it. And you'll find out that you get discounts at dozens of places in the university town, okay? You can go, oh, I get 10% off here. Oh, wow, I, I, can, I can get a discount on, on going to the, getting, getting my tan before I go to the beach for spring break. I had no idea. You're right, you didn't, because nobody communicated that value. And that's why it's really important that you actually do that, okay? Because the thing is, is when people think about marketing, promotion is probably the most common thing they think of. You know, you think of advertising. I mean, that's why I have a ton of advertising students. Hey, advertising students, wanna say hi in my class because they're there to learn, hey, what can we do to help market and promote our products? And because we kind of work together. Because you think about it, if I look at kind of other degrees or other areas out there, when you think of product development, you think like engineers and you, and if you think like pricing, you might think finance and accounting. And if you think place, you think, oh, logistics and supply chain. But when you think promotion, you really do think advertising. But the thing is the promotion aspect of marketing isn't just advertising. There's other things you have to think about too. You know, you got your sales promotions, those deals you're gonna do, that's something that we have to promote and communicate to people so they know, hey, get the $5 foot long, you know, this week only, this kind of stuff we have to talk about. Also though, it's also dealing with our sales force. Are people that are working with our customers, are they communicating with them? Are they letting them know what's available to them? That's why when you go to a store like Best Buy or Saturn, if you're in Germany and stuff like that, to go buy a computer, they ask you, so what do you need it for? Because think about it. Don't they need to know what you need? Because if you're a student that's just gonna write papers and make presentations, well, oh, you can just get that little Chromebook that's not very powerful. But no, I'm making videos, I'm a graphic designer, I have all this stuff. Oh, you need something more powerful. Here is our super duper series. And so they kind of know is what's gonna work best for you. So the Salesforce needs to know that. 
also in our promotions, we also might look at our public relations, right? The good stuff we do in our community and this kind of things. We want to promote the pluses. Look how much our company has donated to the community. Look at us giving back. All these things kind of go in there into that fourth P, that promotion side of thing. Okay. So make sure that you are promoting the values that your product does have those value propositions that are out there. Let people know about it because they don't know. They have no idea. That's why you hear like Miller Lite was great taste and less filling. Oh, we're communicating that it tastes good and it has less calories. Hey, maybe that could be my diet beer and help me on my beer diet. I don't know, but at least they're communicating that value to me. Okay, so I hope this helps you know a little bit better about the fourth P promotions in the four P's of marketing. Don't worry, we got videos on place and product and price as well. So check those out and I'll say bye from, well, wherever I am. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're in New Orleans, Louisiana, and today we're gonna to talk about is the STP process, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Because for marketers, we really need to know this. We need to know is how we're gonna divide up our market, who are we gonna target when we divide it up, and how are we gonna position ourselves for the most attractive for that segment, okay? And the first thing we need to do, the first step is what we call strategy or objectives, okay? What is it we want to do? If you think about it, Overall, when we're segmenting things out, we have to figure out is why am I segmenting them? Is it in order to see, do I segment who would want to go on a trip to New Orleans and who wouldn't want to go to a trip on New Orleans? Or do I segment in, in terms of, oh, I want to talk to business students versus entrepreneurs versus non-business students, these kind of things. You have to think about your objective. Why am I really going to segment these things up? Because if I'm segmenting, because my goal is to increase sales, I want to segment who isn't buying, who is buying, those people who are buying, why are they buying, those people who aren't buying, why aren't they buying? Can I focus on them differently? These kind of things, all right? So what's important in this first step, we really have to analyze the firms. What are we doing well? This is when that SWOT analysis will come in. What are we doing right, right? And so is there something we're doing right that we can keep doing more right to even target more people like that, right? Get some more of that market penetration in there, right? Get, keep getting that things. Or do we see where there's some weaknesses where we're kind of messing up? So McDonald's, they're doing great in terms of location and standardization and their brand, but they have an issue in terms of being perceived as not health conscious. So maybe our objective is, is how does McDonald's change its perception? What we need to figure out is who perceives McDonald's as unhealthy versus healthy and go from there, right? Or think of a tourist destination like New Orleans. When people think of New Orleans, they think Mardi Gras and party time and all kinds of great stuff. But did you know New Orleans has tons of great stuff to see that isn't related to beads and, and, and Bourbon Street? Oh, the zoo that's here, the aquarium, going to the cemeteries and checking that out, the tours, swamp tours, see alligators. There's all kinds of great family things as well and people don't realize that. So they might have an objective is how how do, we t how do we break up our market so we can eventually improve the family friendly image of New Orleans? Because let's be honest, when do you see news of New Orleans? You see it at Mardi Gras. You see them, oh, look at the party times and all kinds of stuff going on, yay! And they don't show the fantastic, fun family things they do here. So you kind of think about those things, all right? And so when we start doing that, we start coming up with our objectives we want to do, that makes it easier for us to move into our next step, and that is our segmentation methods. How are we going to divide up our market? Now, we have a video that goes into about 15 different segmentation models that help you understand how you can break things down, because you're going to use multiple segmentation models to really, you know, break things down. Because it's not just male, female, it might be income and all these demographic things you might think about. You might break it down in terms of situation. Oh, it's a family vacation situation situation people versus a guy's trip situation people versus a conference situation all these kind of things you might break it down that way so you have to think about these different methods you might use in order to segment up your market because in this segmentation method what we're basically trying to do is figure out some descriptions we're developing the descriptions that really get people to fit in these boxes and these segments so we know how we're going to target them okay and we can focus on a lot of different things like i said before now once we've kind of divided up on all these different segments then we have to evaluate segment attractiveness step three decide which one is the most sexy which one is the least sexy basically looking at the ones we can make the most money from the least money from all these kind of things that we're going to be kind of going through those okay to kind of decide is it worth it for us to focus on that group and the thing is people i think make this mistake when they segment they're only segmented on who's going to buy our products you also want to segment on who's not going to buy your products. So maybe you'd make sure you don't advertise to them, or maybe you find out like they're not buying from us. What could we do so they could buy from us? That's one of the things you got to kind of think about. 
okay? We gotta evaluate all these different segments. And we have actually a video that goes through all these evaluation parts. I think it's in Paris, actually, which is a nice thing, or Scotland. It's one of those fun fun ones when I was traveling around the world for that one. But you have like, can you identify the market? You know, is it a big enough size, the substantial size of the market? It, can you actually reach them, the reachable side of things? Are they responsive? Does that market like do what you want them to do? Will they buy your products? Will they come to New Orleans for their family trip? This kind of stuff. And then you look at the profitable side of that segment. Will we make money on it? Because if we're not, we're not gonna lose money. We got to think about these things. And after you've kind of evaluate all these segments, now, boom, we're going for them. And that's step four, selecting a target market. And you might select it. This is the first market we're gonna go for, the second market, the third market. You have that. It's kind of like if you travel around the world and there's a movie coming out you wanna see, sometimes it opens first in the US and in the UK, then in Germany two weeks later. Like, why is that? Well, they have different markets they're gonna target at different times. So you have to think about those things. So we're evaluating each one of those and we're selecting who we're gonna go for first, okay? Because really we're selecting who we're gonna go for, but also we're selecting who we're not gonna go for, okay? at this time. And so once we've selected our target marketing, then we have to develop our positioning strategy. We have to develop ourselves to make sure we fit into what that target really wants. So if I decide I wanna go make a restaurant, right? And it's gonna focus on Americana and people that wanna have all American kind of stuff, what do I need to do to position my restaurant for that? Well, I gotta have a, a Statue of Liberty there, right? And I gotta have some cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, and I've gotta have really American stuff. There's got, there, you have to have burgers there. There's gotta be burgers and fries, maybe throw in some meatloaf or something like that. You're gonna have this like super uber American stuff because that signifies that position, okay? We're looking at the attributes that are important for that position to fit into that thing. That's why when you go into a fancy restaurant, how do they position them, themselves? Well, you're gonna see that when they walk in, the professionalism at the hostess stand, right? Or the host stand, or, or the waiters, how they interact with you, the menu they have. I mean, what their menu looks like. I mean, think about it. If you walk into a restaurant and they give you a menu that's on a laminated piece of paper, you're not expecting to spend much. But if they give you one, it's like in a leather bound book, you're like, oh, is this the Cheesecake Factory? This is so fancy with all these things. Oh my goodness. You think of that, it really is helping them to position themselves in the mind of consumers in a certain way. So really kind of think of those product attributes that are really gonna fit in to that positioning, okay? So you might look at it in terms of, like for consumers, they might look at, you know, value. How much do I get value out of this? We might look at those things or, or, or the attributes that have to go into these products or the symbols we're gonna use, like the cowboy hat and the American flag for Mark's Americana Diner. These kind of things we wanna think about. Other thing you might look at is the music you're gonna use or, or the color scheme you're gonna have, what kind of gets people interested in your products. That's why when you look at it at university towns, you see a lot of the university colors in all the stores. Why? Because they're positioning themselves to be appealing to people from the university. And that's why when you're looking at your positioning, you want to make sure these attributes, these things you're doing really call to the value that you're out there. You're really showing how that positioning is better than other competitors for your competition. That's why we make it over American, over Americana looking. There's a Route 66 sign and, and everything's titled the Route 66 experience instead of our tasting table. It's our Route 66 experience. We have all kinds of things from Route 66, like corn dogs from Springfield, Illinois, and things like that, we do those things. And when you take all these five steps together, it really gives you that segmentation, targeting, positioning model. So you have a really good idea of how I'm breaking my customers down, what groups they go in, who I'm gonna target, and how am I gonna position myself for the most success? And that's what you're going for. So when you take these five steps together in the segmentation, targeting, positioning process, the STP process, when you take that together, it really makes it easier for you as a business to be successful because you're actually targeting people and selling to people with things they want and who wants it most versus randomly throwing a dart in the air thinking, sure, maybe somebody will buy that. So make sure you remember that's that process. One, you have your strategy or objectives, right? You gotta set that out. Then the second step, you have your segmentation methods, how we're gonna divide up our firms. And then we have to analyze them, right? We have to analyze and evaluate each one of those segments, right? And then we have to determine which ones we're gonna target. And then we figure out how we're gonna position ourselves to look the most attractive for them so they go for us versus other YouTube channels that might not be as awesome for them as it is for these students like yourself. Anyway, I wish you all the best and I'll say bye from here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here at the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And today we're gonna to talk about is marketing myopia. You don't know what marketing myopia is? This is when the best products actually fail because they're the worst products. And you're thinking to yourself, wait, if it's the best product, it should be a success. 
And that's what directors of companies think, directors and screenwriters of movie thinks, producers think of movies, engineers think, if I make the best product, everybody will buy it. But the thing is, is the best product that we make might not be what our customers want. And that's the kind of key premise behind marketing myopia. Because it's when firms pay more attention to the actual product or service they're trying to develop or the experience they're trying to develop, that they don't look for the benefits, values, or experiences that their customers actually want. So I'm here in the Serengeti, okay? I'm on a great safari tour here. We're going through, I've seen lions, I've seen leopards, I've seen hippos. I mean, I've seen pretty much all the big five. I mean, it's just been a really amazing experience. Our guide has been fantastic. The places we stayed at have been great. It's been a great overall experience. But you know what? If they decided what would make the best safari experience well we need to have luxury hotels and we need to make sure there's toilets all over the place we need to make sure everyone has great food wherever they go and we think of all this but we forget about the animals well it doesn't matter how nice my camp is and that there's indoor plumbing and stuff like that if i don't get to see the lion or i don't see the cheetah going by like i saw today i mean you want those things that's what people want you know, marketing my open, you forget about what is the most important thing to the client. Because as nice as my camp is, I'm staying out here, and as wonderful as my guide is, if I'm not seeing the animals, it's not a good experience for me. And you might see this in movies sometimes. A few years ago, they had a movie called Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. And I can see the thought process of it. We're going to make a Superman movie. Yeah, and then someone says, well, what would be an even better Superman movie than just a Superman movie? Let's put Superman and Batman together. Oh, yeah. And then what's one of the best Superman and Batman, you know, topics ever? Oh, when it was the Dark Knight where the Dark Knight Batman took on Superman. So we'll have them going against each other, but, but what could make it even better? Well, another great story is the death of Superman. So what if we put Doomsday in there as well and we kill Superman and we could do those things. And then what if we did, um, and then with that, but of course we need more stuff because Wonder Woman, we need Wonder Woman in there too. And could we put anybody else in there? And you can see how they get all excited and they start putting all these things in and they're thinking, yes, we're going to have nostalgia with the old Batman. We're going to have, you know, the new stuff with Superman and then all the cool CGI that people like and the battles and the blowing up things like they like in the Marvel movies. We're going to put it all together. And the thing is, they made a movie that was a disaster. Because the one thing that people want doesn't matter if it's a romantic comedy, it doesn't matter if it's a if it's, you know, a sci-fi action flick or a superhero movie, people want a good story. That's what they want. It doesn't matter how cool the bells and whistles are if the story sucks. And that's where marketing myopia comes in. We get too concerned with the bells and whistles and making it the perfect everything that we forget about the clients. And that's why I hope you can learn that when you're developing new products and you're marketing to clients and developing things, you're listening to them. You're hearing what their wants are. You're hearing what their desires are. You're hearing what their needs are. And you're developing things that answer those wants, needs, and desires, not things that you think is gonna make a good product. Because yes, you can make a good product, it could succeed, but if you make a product that's targeted for those, those customers, it's more of a better chance that it will succeed in the end. So I hope that helps you know what marketing myopia is. Basically, you focus on the product and you don't care about your customers and therefore you're probably gonna fail. That's what we're looking at. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in here and give you a chance to see the beautiful Serengeti National Park. Oh, sadly, there's only a few animals back there right now, but more will be here later. Anyway, I wish you all the best. And if you're studying for an exam, I hope this helps you know that. If you're trying to figure out what marketing myopia was, I hope this way too long definition helped you out a little bit. Anyway, bye from Tanzania. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna to talk about value-based marketing. And when people talk about value, a lot of times they just think, oh, the lowest price, that's the best value. Well, here's the thing, the lowest price isn't necessarily the best value. What you're looking for is the best deal. What is gonna give me the biggest bang for my buck? What's the one that's gonna make me feel like I'm getting the most for paying the least for that? And it's not just getting things cheaply, it's getting things where you really feel that, hey, I feel like I got something extra from that, right? And so we really have to think about that. And when you're looking at value-based marketing, what you have to realize is people's perception of value will be different. Okay, a lot of times it might depend on, you know, where you live or might be on your background or what you've bought before in your, your purchasing history, you know? Think about it. If you've bought multiple the same thing, you have an idea of what the price should be, right? Like, we travel a lot. So if I know, if I'm going in the summer, if I can get a ticket for $1,000 to Europe, I'm like, hey, you know, that's, that's a decent price. And so if I see one for $800, I'm like, wow, that's a good deal. Now, that's not cheap. 
but I feel it's a good deal in comparison. On the other side, if people don't have that background, they haven't bought a lot of tickets, they don't know. Is that a good price? I'm not really sure. And so perception becomes a really big thing. And, and when you look at it over time, the, the, you know, what was one time a really good value might not be anymore. Like if I think back to what my buddies paid, the very first DVD player I ever saw was when I was in college. I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. And I'm sure that dude probably spent a thousand dollars on it. And now you're like a thousand dollars for a DVD player. Who would even get a DVD player? Where would you even buy a DVD player? Like I wouldn't spend more than 10 bucks on one, right? And you realize is, wait, it, it's because the perception of what was important and what the value was for then and now is very different. And so we really have to think about that. And that's why it's important to realize when you're looking at value, your new competition can really impact the value that people find in your products. Because you may do a great job and charging a price you think is very good value, but then someone else comes in and charges a completely different price, offering a completely different different set of products a different value proposition and that changes how everybody sees everything you know it's kind of like you know a few years ago when the switch came out for nintendo it was you know yeah it was a good value because you know it was it was a lot more affordable than the xbox or the playstation 4 right and it had some pretty cool games you know so you had that but now you look at it, it's like well it's not really as big of a value as it was because back then there was a lot of different games but now you're seeing that the new cool games, like the newest Star Wars games or whatever, they're not coming on the Switch, they're coming on the Xbox, the newest PlayStations and stuff like that. So my vision of value of what I thought, wow, the, the Switch was a good value back in the day, and now I'm like, eh, not really. Maybe I do get my kid the PlayStation 5 so he can play, you know, the new Star Wars game and the Miles Morales Spider-Man game and those things. And, and there's different things I start to value. And you have to realize that because bringing out those cool new games makes the newer Xboxes, the newer PlayStations look a lot better than the Switch. So the value really isn't there anymore. Even it is a lot cheaper than those newest versions of the other consoles, all right? And so that's why it's really important you kind of take this all into perspective when you are looking at value. Because again, just because the burger is a dollar doesn't mean I think I have to buy it because it's the lowest price item. If I see they have the daily double there, you know, a double cheeseburger for $1.50, I'm like, Hey, now that I feel is a deal because a double is usually like three bucks. It's that perspective, okay? It's how people are valuing things, all right? So if you ever get a deal, you know, if you're one of my students from, you know, from the University of Illinois and you get a, you know, a deal for, oh, $10 for a bus to Chicago. Well, dang, that's a really good price. But is it a good value? If they tell you, oh, we leave at midnight here and we drop you off at, you know, O'Hare Terminal 5 at 4 a.m., um, you know, you're like, well, um, wait a minute, why, why would I want to be there at 4 a.m.? There's no flights and I, I need to go to one of the other suburbs. It's not really paying off. Even though it's the lowest price, it's not a good value. It'd be better for me to buy something else. That's why when you're looking at cheap airlines, whether you're looking at Legion or Spirit or EasyJet or Ryanair or whoever, you don't just say, you don't just look at the price that the ticket is, you look at the overall value you're getting for us. Like, look, if I get in at 10 in the morning, it doesn't matter what airport I get into, I can find public transportation into the city. But if I'm getting at 10 o'clock at night, well, then I have to take a taxi in and if the taxi is $100 and the ticket was only $50, I might as well have bought the $100 ticket from somebody else and got in a normal time and had free public transport. So you really have to take all these things into consideration. And when you're starting to develop value-based marketing, some things you really need to do is you have to realize you really need to be sharing information. You need to set up things so everybody in your supply chain can be talking to you so you can see where those changes are happening. You can see where people are valuing things. You know, look, I love going to Culver's. I love that. But the thing is, when you go and you go through the drive-thru there, you know, it's Culver's, they make the food for you. So you have to sit and wait, right? And you're like, is there something that they could be doing to add value at that point? Because for me, it's like, look, I'm on the highway. I got to get going. I don't have time to wait. I just want to blow through there. And we start to realize, hey, if I share that with them, maybe they have our special highway menu. You know, it's like we have five things that'll be out in your car in two seconds or less. I mean, maybe there's something you come up with, but you need to know this information. You need to be sharing that information about what people are valuing and then creating products that match into that. Okay, so then you see that, oh, they value this. I need to deliver on that, okay? Now, another thing you have to realize when you're looking at value is really kind of balancing the costs and the benefits. And you really need, to, that's why it's important, like when you communicate, these all kind of tie together. When you communicate, you learn their needs, wants, and desires, right? But the thing is, is we have to balance it out. People want a cheap flight, but they also want a safe flight, 
right? They want a cheap flight, but they want a clean flight. They want a cheap flight, but they want to get to the airport they want to go to. You know, that's one of those things. I mean, do you want to land at O'Hare or do you want to land at Midway or do you want to land at Peoria, right? I mean, it's all like Chicago land area. You kind of have to put these things into perspective, all right, to give yourself an idea. So make sure you're balancing those things out and realize what do people care about? And then I think with all this, which is kind of an obvious one, is when you want to really build value and have an understanding of a value-based marketing, you really need to build relationships. So this is, you know, when you're developing a customer relationship, yes, it's knowing their wants and needs, desires and things like that, but you're keeping track of it. You are understanding why they're doing those things. So you can see, it's like, hey, if they're valuing a home and I see, oh, they, they have kids and their kids are eventually going to go to school and go to college. Well, if I'm a financial advisor, my value market is, yeah, we cost more for the trade, but we develop you, we've developed for you a financial plan for 20 years, not two. Oh yeah, because we know that Caleb and Liam, they're in grade school now, but then they're gonna be in high school, then college, and then, then you got grandkids down. I mean, do you wanna have something to leave behind for them? Oh yeah, good point. I maybe I don't wanna blow it all right now. And so you see that and building that relationship really helps because then you can understand what they're, what's valuable to them. But also people value that relationship because I like not having to explain what I want 500 times. I like when I go to my favorite restaurant, they're like Mark, I'm like Marlene. They're like, dos sopes. I'm like, that's right. And they're like, cool, here's your tecate and we're good to rock and roll. And so you have these experiences out there and it really helps people value things better. So I just want to put that in your mind when you're looking at value-based marketing. So I hope it can help you out. Anyway, I'll say bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today I want to talk about why is marketing important? You know, because a lot of people sit back and say, Pfft, marketing, Pfft. why do I need that? It's some silly, people buy my stuff no matter what. Why do I need this crap? Well, here's the thing people, marketing is important for a lot of different reasons. One of the big ones is it helps you understand your client. It helps you understand what their wants are, their needs are, their desires are, their demands are, what they're looking for, what they value. So you can build things up. You can figure out, hey, what accounting services do they really want? Which ones they're willing to pay for? Because you're going to need marketing and understanding of your clients. So you can say, look, you can do your taxes at Walmart or you can have us do it at EY. There's different prices, there's, there's different things you're offering and marketing helps us figure out these things by helping us understand how our customers work, how they function. Another reason why marketing is really important because it again, it helps us develop new products, new services. We might be using marketing to develop things. We might be marketing to talk to our clients, say, wait, you want a burger with three slices of cheese? The triple cheese cheeseburger? Oh my gosh! Like you can come up with things, like marketing helps you understand that. It helps you understand what products can and can't work. Other things you have to look at is how marketing really help you, you know, inspire yourself. Because you see there's lots of marketers out there that have been inspired, that are like, yes, the, the ideas I've come from is when I've seen there's demands that aren't being met. If you look at Reed Hastings, he's the guy who started Netflix, or one of the people that started Netflix, you know, they, they when they started Netflix, they were like, look, I hate, like what's the worst, what was the worst part of renting movies? It was play, paying late fees. Oh, I don't want to do that. Let's do something so there's no late fees anymore. Let's solve that problem. And says, you know what? Let's just mail people DVDs in the mail and not worry about it. Now, the empire's expanded a lot more because I'm sure some of you might be watching Netflix while you're actually um, watching this video. I mean, it happens, it's okay. But he was inspired by that. He saw that, look, we could be the at-home entertainment deliverer. And at first it was mailing DVDs to people and then it was having, you know, the Netflix that we all know and love for our Netflix and chill nights and stuff. And now wouldn't you be surprised if Netflix all of a sudden started having gaming as well that you can download games right away? I mean, yeah, it's at home. I mean, this is all marketing. This all this ideas they came up with. Jeff Bezos, marketing inspired him. He saw, look, People, there's this internet out there, there's a new opportunity for us, a new way people could buy. And yeah, he started off selling books and now it's pretty much everything. Like I'm recording now, the the camera I'm using, I'm recording on, I bought that through Amazon. The uh, the microphone on top, that's from Amazon. The, the tripod I have from Amazon. Heck, the paper that my script is printed on, from Amazon. And oh yeah, the printer ink cartridge, also from Amazon. I mean, you see this like, wow, like, it really can inspire people. Like entrepreneurs really do get inspired by marketing, by seeing things. Steve Jobs was a great marketer. He saw that, look, if you develop cool products that people love, remember, 
understanding your clients and making new products, those things we talked about before, why marketing is important, that really got them going. And so you see that and, and when we start looking at it, marketing can really help us in other ways. I mean, really it does help us expand our business domestically, but also around the globe. Because once we understand how our business works with local customers, sometimes we can take that knowledge and move it on to another group, right? It's like, hey, maybe that could work someplace else. That can look here, that could work in this new market. And so we can grow that way. And the thing is there's tons of ways that marketing is really important. But the last one we'll talk about is looking at marketing within your supply chain. I mean, market, I mean, think about it. If you're selling the cool product, doesn't that kind of influence everything? Like, oh, I, you know, it's one thing like, oh yeah, I sell, I sell Apple products. Oh, aren't you cool? Oh yeah, I deliver Apple products. Oh, you make Apple products? Yeah, I deliver them. He makes them, my buddy over here. Oh, he's cool. Oh, well, she designed them. Oh, she's cool because she designs Apple products. And you see there's all this kind of like, oh, that, that kind of aura that goes along with it, right? And so we start to see, it's like, wow. The, the marketing of our brand, the market of our products really can influence a lot of things. And so we, we look at that and say, hey, that's something important. We need to work on our branding. We need to develop that it means something. Why is it people go crazy for anything with that Apple logo slapped on the side? The design, the branding, the marketing, the cool factor. I mean, I don't, I don't have an iPhone. I have, I, I have a Samsung, and I'm too embarrassed to even have it with me, so I can't even show it to you, right? So you kind of look at this and go, wait a minute, what's going on here? You realize, hey, it will actually be found throughout your supply chain because you will need to market. If I'm Apple, I mean, yes, people love Apple products, but Apple still has to market to those suppliers saying, hey, would you, we want to, we want to hire you to make our new chips or our new screens for our phone. But also they have to market to AT&T or T-Mobile. Hey, we want you to carry our new iPhone 35, right? And here's why it's going to be good for you. So they have to market it there. So it's really important to know your marketing because people don't just show up at your door. People, I mean, you can have the greatest product ever, but people are not necessarily going to buy it. You gotta let them know about it. So you're looking at knowing what they want, making what they want, communicating with them about these things. And so there's a lot of ways that marketing really is important. So I hope a few of these helped you out. And why do you think marketing is important? Put in the comments down below so we can know some more good things out there. About marketing at least. Bye. Hey the film marketers, Professor Walters here, and today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how we can create value, and when we create that value, it helps us build a relationship with our customer. Because here's the thing is, think about your friendships. The more experiences you have with people, they become your better and better friends, right? I mean, if you think back, your freshman year, your first day at school, you might have met your future best friend, your future girlfriend or boyfriend or partner. You, you might have met them that day, but you didn't know it right away, right? It took time to develop that relationship, to kindle and, and start that flame of bursting of love between you two, whatever. It takes time, right? And there's things that companies can do to help people you know, realize what the value is and create that value for our customer that helps bring in that relationship. It's kind of like when you realize Oh, I've got a friend of mine that, you know, they like to have a good time, they like to go drink some beers together. Yeah, I'll go out with them. So I know my buddy Mike, want to have a good time? We're hitting some beers, right? My other buddy, I got a buddy named Mark, and have a good time with him. Hey, he likes to actually dig up things. He likes to go and, and work in the dirt. And so we'll go cut down some trees or dig up some stuff, bushes or replant some stuff. We'll do that because that creates value for him. And I know that because the relationship and it makes our relationship stronger and therefore they find more value in our friendship. And, and these are examples that we as companies can actually think about and use in order to really create value and build those relationships. So where we start is we really have to realize is we need to understand the market and know what the customer's needs and wants are. Because if we know that, it's gonna be easy for us to develop a relationship because we know what they need. We know what they want. It's kind of like with my kids, I know what they need. What do they need? They need food, they need toys, they need Nintendo, right? And so if I have that, they're more likely gonna say, Dad, I love you, thanks, Dad. I mean, yes, I pay off my kids sometimes. Yeah, they're, they're like teenagers, man. What am I gonna do, okay? But I realize is once I know what my kids' needs and wants are, it helps me to develop something that truly will answer their wants and needs. So if I know my oldest son, you know, he wanted to play online with his buddies. He wanted to play Call of Duty and Fortnite and all that stuff. He wanted to do those things. And, and so I look at it, it's like, okay, he wants to make sure he can play Call of Duty, uh, World of Warcraft. He wants to play Fortnite. He wants to do all this stuff. So we need, he needs a gaming system that will work. Now they've had the Nintendo Wii and they've had the Wii U and they had the Switch. 
but I knew now I got a teenager and the switch isn't going to cut it. So what do we do? We'll get him an Xbox, right? So I got him an Xbox and he liked that. And I was like, hey, thanks, Dad. I mean, he was really happy with it because I knew what he needed he or what he wanted. He wanted to be able to play with his friends, you know, online gameplay. Switch, it's harder to do that. So, hey, I develop what you want. You're more likely to be happy. Okay, so that helped build, help strengthen the relationship with my oldest son, right? And I'm sure some of you can think of things like that. If you think of Apple when they developed the iPhone, they thought, what do people want? Well, well, we they have their phone in this pocket, they have their camera in this pocket, they have their MP3 player in their back pocket. What if we put all that together in one pocket? Huh, in one device. And so they developed the iPhone to put it all in one thing because that's what people wanted. I wanted some space in my pants for my keys and my wallet. And now, heck, you don't even need your wallet anymore. That's in your phone too. So you see what they're doing there? They're understanding those wants and needs and developing products for that and developing that relationship because of it, because we know what they want and they need, right? Now, another thing you can do is really if you have what's called a customer value driven marketing strategy so everything we're doing it's not about me everything i do i do it for you the client if you're starting to make products that are for them that talks about the value of our product in terms of the customer hey our battery lasts twice as long hey our toilet paper has 50,000 more rolls on it right oh we kill an extra 99.9 percent of bacteria in our wipes i mean you do that it's starting to show that look we're not developing stuff for us this is for you these are products that you really are caring about that that's really for you and that's going to help build a relationship it's kind of like you know when, when someone does something nice for you and they don't want anything for it you're like Why'd you do that? What do you want? You're like, nothing. I'm like, well, that, thank you. That was very altruistic of you. That kind of altruistic mentality. If you have that when you're developing your products and showing your customers, look, this is where this could be a value to. This is how it could help you. Your battery last, lasting twice as long. I mean, think about it. If I put that battery up the last twice as long at my parents' house and their smoke detector, does my 70 some year old mom need to be climbing up a 12 foot ladder? Heck no. So you see the value there? Oh, I don't have to worry about grandma falling. You have that, okay? Now, another thing I wanna look at is if you develop a fully integrated marketing program that has a better value than your competitors, that's also gonna do a better job. I mean, if you build a better mousetrap, people are probably gonna buy it. And that's the thing, is as much as people love Nintendo and they love Sega, when PlayStation came out back in the 90s, I mean, it was such a cooler concept and such cooler, gra like, it was just awesome. You're like, man, that is that is just so cool. Like, I'm on board. It doesn't matter that I had the NES, the Super Nintendo, the Genesis, that, bye bye I'm playing PlayStation. You had that. And so by building that better master, building that better system, building that better burger, that can get people to come over to because they'll value that. I love my Culver's. My Culver's, it's a Wisconsin-based fast food burger chain, okay? And they talk about we have fresh beef from three good cuts of beef, and they show them making it. You're like, man, that looks like legit like legit burger stuff, not like McDonald's, which doesn't always look legit burgery sometimes. You know, like, I didn't know. Anyway. But, but the thing is, they're showing that how it's nice or how it's better for you. Not Maybe not healthier for you, but like it's a better burger. And so they do that. So you're like, you know what? I do identify with that. that. That is something like you're thinking about a better experience for me, right? Like, hey, we bring the food to the table for you. You don't want to have to carry nine trays with all your kids and stuff. No, we do it for you. Just sit down. Here, you go get your drinks. We'll bring that stuff too. You didn't want some ketchup or maybe mayonnaise or whatever? We'll bring that to your table too. So it's one of those things that can like develop a relationship with that extra value you're adding. And the thing is, is when you're looking at creating value, it's not just creating value about for your clients, but also creating a valuable relationship between yourself and the clients. Because we want to have a beneficial relationship. We want to have a profitable relationship. I just want to make everything like so affordable and cheap to my clients that I'm losing money because you'll go out of business that way. And so what we want to do is really figure out a way that, look, they feel like they're getting a lot out of this and we're making a profit out of it at the same time. And so that's where you look at something like Amazon. Like Amazon, I mean, how many of you have had like $32 of stuff in your cart? And they're like, oh, for an extra $3, it's free shipping. Like you never buy $3, so you buy like another 50 bucks. But hey, I got free shipping, right? And so for me, I'm like, I got free shipping, yay! And so I feel like I get a benefit. And then 
of course, Amazon, hey, we're selling more stuff, we're getting more people, that they're getting a benefit out of that, so you can look at it that way. Or if you look at Amazon Prime, look, you pay a fee to, to have the two-day shipping, so I value that two-day shipping, it's great, they value my money, perfect, and so we're all kind of winning here. And so it's really kind of an interesting thing, because you do that, it builds a relationship. I mean, I was talking to my dad, who's a little bit older than me, I mean, genetically speaking, you know, and, and he was saying, he's like, you know, I don't know if I ever need to go to a store again. I mean, with Amazon, I can just order and it's there like the next day, or or if it's live two days with Prime, he's like, why would I do anything else? Like he values that. It's like we create a relationship. He's like, Amazon all the way, which is, you know, you, you don't expect that from a elderly dude. Like, you know, like grandpa, like what? Grandpa's all about Amazon? Oh yeah, grandpa is all in on Amazon, all right? So I just wanna kind of think about that. And so when you're kind of looking at all these things, really caption that value from the customers and all this kind of stuff really helps you just have a win-win situation. You know, where, where you're winning because you're making a profit and they're winning because they're feeling like they're getting a lot of value for the money they're spending. And so that's why when you look at marketing, you're creating that value and you're capturing that value and creating value for your customers, it really has a really great impact. So, I hope this helps you learn more. Anyway, I'll leave you out of here, or I'll let, I'm just gonna go. Yeah, I'm just gonna go. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers. Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna talk about not our successes, we're gonna talk about our failures. And we're gonna look at some one of the common reasons why marketers actually fail. Like things don't always work out. We don't always increase our sales. We don't always get to be reached out and get in contact with our customers. We do mess up sometimes. And that's what I wanna talk about today are just a few of the more common reasons why marketers fail. And as a marketer, I have to start off with talking about not doing enough research, okay? Not understanding enough about what clients wants are, their needs are, not having enough product offerings that meet those things. Okay, that's why it's important to do the market research to figure out what are all the things people need in this kind of product, in this service, so therefore we can make something that they really want. Okay, because you may think, oh yes, everyone likes hot dogs, it's great. But if you don't do the research and find out that people want ketchup and mustard and relish for those hot dogs, of course you're gonna fail because there's the extra stuff out there. So one thing, one thing, reason we fail, we don't do enough research. Second thing, we underestimate our competition and what they may be able to do. Now we can think, oh, I'll make a product that our competition can never match. Well, I'll tell you right now, any product you make, your competition can make a copycat like that, okay? So make sure you realize that and understand what your competition can do, what they will do, and you can adjust to those things, okay? So don't underestimate the competition because they can wipe you out. Ask anybody in the tablet industry in the early 2010s when the iPad just wiped everybody out because they were just so much better, okay? Next reason why marketers fail is a lot of times they don't keep up with social changes, cultural changes, political changes, life changes out there. And if you're doing your commercials with bell bottoms and stuff like that, it's not the 70s anymore. If you're talking about, hey, let's get Robert Patterson and the Twilight crew, um, that stuff hasn't been cool for like 10 years. You know, you have to think about these things. You gotta keep up. Who's the new cool actor? Who's the new popular director? What are What's important to people now? I mean, if you think about it in terms of the environment, what's important about the environment or food? I mean, for a while it's no GMOs. Now it's all organic. Now it's, you know, also, you know, farm to table. These kind of things change. If we don't keep up with that, boom, we fall behind, okay? So that's why you're seeing, you know, fast food restaurants are putting out healthier options. They're putting out some gluten, I mean, you can get gluten-free pizza and stuff like that, because they're seeing that society's changing and we need to change too. But if you don't change, you don't know what changes to make, of course you're gonna fail, okay? Also, going back to our competition, another thing you might wanna say is not maybe, un maybe one, the promise that was underestimating them, but also is not keeping up with the competition. Remember, if you're, if you're an older folk like myself, you remember Nokia just controlled the entire mobile phone industry? I remember 10 years ago, something like that when I was, when I was teaching, and I'd ask, what phone does everyone have? And 90% of the class would say, Nokia! And now I ask students, who has a Nokia? Nobody. Who remembers having a Nokia? They go like this, I go, remember when you played Tetris and Snake 2 on your parents' phone? Yeah, I'm like, then you had a, a Nokia. They're like, oh, right. And what Nokia did is they didn't keep up with their competition. Think about it. The iPhones came out and the Galaxies came out and it took them, what, five years to come up with their Lumia, their smartphone? Man, you didn't keep up with your competition. You're gonna get blown away. And it works in restaurants, fast food restaurants. If you see that one's doing well with a dollar menu or a Euro menu or a value menu, maybe we should do the same thing. And so you'll see McDonald's and, and Wendy's and Burger King, they all have kind of a value menu option because we have to keep up with them. 
Okay. Another reason why marketers may fail is they may just see the world in rose colored glasses. Everything is awesome. Yay. Everything is perfect here. There are no problems here. And you kind of look at things with this, this, these rose colored glasses, like it's going to be all right. If you go back to the old new Coke debacle, okay, they looked at it. Well, of course, people will be excited about a new Coke. Why wouldn't they be? It was a complete disaster because they were looking at it like everyone will be happy about this when in reality it maybe isn't that way. So don't be like everything is positive. Make sure you're being very objective with what you're doing and say what could go right and what could go wrong, okay? And prepare for those kind of things. Another issue that I see quite a few times actually is you see that they actually screw up their pricing, okay? Like maybe you didn't price it right. Maybe you, you price it too high or sometimes you price things too low. I'm like, man, the demand for this is so high. I could have sold this at a higher price and made a lot more money. And you may think, well, you're doing well. You're selling a lot of products at a lower price. Well, I need profit to pay for my business. So those can be issues. So make sure you're doing the research on pricing. What do people feel is a good value for that price? What are competitors pricing their goods at to have an idea? Because that's why when you look at the dollar menus or the euro menus at different fast food places, they all have pretty much the same thing. Their burger, their cheese, like the kid's burger, the smallest cheeseburger, the smallest hamburger, the small fries, the small drink. You know, like there's certain things they all kind of have because they realize that, look, for this kind of pricing, there's certain things we have to have in there, okay? Also, that messed up pricing, you might want to think about the pricing that people associate with your brand. I mean, if McDonald's comes out with an $8 cheeseburger, I'm sorry, it's McDonald's. I'm not spending $8 for a McDonald's cheeseburger, okay? In my mind, a McDonald's cheeseburger is a dollar, not eight bucks. I'm not paying eight times the price for it. And these are things you got to think about. And another marketing fail, I think, that causes it is we might not use the right channels to get to our customers. Now, that channels could be like how we talk to them, because if I'm going to be talking to my students, my college students, I'm not using Facebook. I'm not using Twitter because they don't use Facebook or Twitter. What I do is I use Instagram. So go to at Walters World on Instagram and you'll see me there and I'll be talking to my students there. But I know for my, my more mature crowd, I've got Facebook for them. That's the right channel for them. But if I don't do that, well, if I only use Instagram, I miss out on my, my older crowd. If I only use Facebook, I miss out on my younger crowd. So I'm choosing the wrong communication channel with them. Another thing you might look at is the wrong, is the wrong channel in terms of where you're selling. Like if I'm trying to give the allure that I'm a high-end fancy product, well, I need to be in a high-end fancy store. And if I'm selling it at Aldi or Lidl or Walmart, it's not necessarily giving off the right kind of vibe, let's say, and it might be the wrong channel for me. And that's the thing is finding the right channel for your products and your services can be pretty tough. And that's why you got to do the research. When people are buying products like this, what do they think of? Where do they go? So if I want to have a new high end phone, I want to make sure I have it at AT&T or Best Buy where the fancier phones are sold, not at, you know, Walmart or off the shelf, you know, at a convenience store kind of thing, because those are kind of seen as the cheaper phones. All right. So I hope this helps you know some of the kind of basic ideas that I see and others see in terms of why marketers fail. Uh, there's tons of reasons why marketers fail. There's a lot more than these. If you have some of the ways they fail, put in the comment section below so everybody can learn about new ways that marketers fail so we don't make those same mistakes again. OK, so I hope this helps you know a bit more about marketing fails, but hopefully we can have a lot more successes in the end. So I wish you all a great time. If you do like these marketing videos, hit that subscribe button. Uh, give us a like up there. That really makes a big difference for us. And hopefully you'll get to see more of our marketing videos here on there. We also do videos on YouTube, uh, teaching, all kinds of good stuff. So I wish you all the best and bye from here in the classroom.